We began this morning in reading out of a very familiar passage, John, the third chapter. I'm beginning in verse 16, looking down to verse 21. Many of us could probably recite verse 16 without having to read it, but I will read it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. God so loved the world. Which God so loved the world? Might seem like a strange question because you and I know the answer. But I raise that question because we live in a culture that increasingly has no idea of the God that we know and that we serve. Barack Obama in 2006 made this statement in a speech before he was elected president. Whatever we once were, we are no longer a Christian nation, at least not just. We are also a Jewish nation, a Muslim nation, and a Buddhist nation, and a Hindu nation, and a nation of non-believers. A few years later, 2009, Newsweek magazine devoted an entire issue to the decline and fall of Christian America, stating that the present is less about the death of God and more about the birth of many gods. Folks, that's the world and culture that we live in. So when we talk about God, we understand that among ourselves. But again, we live in a country, we live in a culture that has many, many gods, perhaps more every day. So the people that we are called to reach with the gospel, the John 3.16 gospel, are very unclear about the God that you and I know and serve, and they're rather skeptical, we might add, about the claim that he's the only true God. Again, that's the situation that we face today. So when we share John 3.16, that very familiar verse, when we share that verse with others, again, they're asking the question, which God is it that so loved the world? Who is his only begotten son? And why should I believe? Why should I have faith? Can the Bible that John 3.16 is found in, can the Bible itself be trusted? And when you say perish, what exactly does it mean to perish? And why is there death in the world today anyway? And what about sin that you talk about that I need to repent of? I never knew that I was lost. Those are the kinds of reactions that we face as we seek to share. So again, John 3.16 that we look at here today is indeed the best known Bible verse. It is the verse probably most often used for evangelism and witnessing, but as we're saying, it is less clear in the world that we live in today than it ever has been before. So not only the truth of John 3.16 that we try to convince others of, but perhaps the bigger challenge is convincing people of the truth of the Bible of which that verse is found in and that Yahweh is the only true God and the author of the Bible that we place our faith in. It is a challenging mission that we have today. And we know it is an urgent mission. Again, I look in verses 17 and 18. In Jesus' words, he says, God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. In verse 18, it's one or two options. He who believes in him is not judged, but he who does not believe has been judged already in a state of condemnation because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. 
And again, a skeptical society questions that, but we know that it is a life and death matter that we talk about here, that every person must make a decision for Jesus Christ because according to his own words, if they've not made a decision in favor of faith for him, they're already in a condemned state. And so people are lost right now without Christ, and that is certainly a very, very serious matter. The decision we know has to be based upon faith. Once again, we overlap with what's going on in the adult Sunday school class talking about faith. Faith, of course, is the key thing. Faith in the one true God, not in the Muslim God, not in the Buddhist God, not in the Hindu God or any other God, but the only God, the I Am, Yahweh God. So when I think about that faith, it's so important for a skeptical society to have I think it reframes a very, very important verse about faith in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, that says, he who comes to God, this phrase really stands out to me, he who comes to God must believe that he is, and I might add to that, must believe that he is the only true God out of all the other gods of our culture, and that he's a rewarder of those who seek him. So we see that faith in our culture is a little bit different even than what we have understood faith in the past. Again, in a skeptical age that we live in, the faith that one needs to have to be saved is far more challenging than ever before. When I think about faith and I think about the faith, the gospel, I often think about the, the Apostle Peter's message on the day of Pentecost. And I think that Acts chapter 2, the message that Peter gave that day, I think that is the best gospel presentation that you can find anywhere. If you want to know how to share your faith, if you want to share the, the message with others, that I think is a great blueprint. But there's one issue that's a challenge in our culture today. I'm looking in verse 22 of Acts chapter 2, and I want you to notice what Peter says as he begins his message. He says, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, notes this phrase, just as you yourselves know. The culture that Peter spoke against understood. They were familiar with the facts. Jewish culture. They knew their Bibles. They knew the events of recent days. And so Peter had the opportunity to, to start with something that they all understood together. These things that you already know. Again, we live in a bit of a different time. We live in an age where the message doesn't fly, excuse me, fly quite the same way today because it cannot be said to our culture just as you yourselves know. A culture that doesn't necessarily know and is skeptical of the things they claim that we know. And so it is a challenge. So I think that there's another message that maybe is especially fitting for the challenge of the times that we live in and one maybe we need to become increasingly familiar with. It's found in the book of Acts in chapter 17. Message by the Apostle Paul in the city of Athens, Greece at a place called Mars Hill. And so I encourage you to turn over there for just a few moments because that certainly seems like a message appropriate to the culture that we live in today. Acts 17, I pick up in verse 23. Verse 22, it talks about how Paul stood up and addressed the men of Athens. He says, I observe that you're very religious in all respects. I might pause and say, if we have a plethora of gods in this day and age, that fits our culture as well. I observe that you're very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, 
as even some of your own poets have said, for we are all his children. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Again, folks, I believe that's a great blueprint for the culture that surrounds us today. That's pretty basic, but that serves as a great starting point for, first of all, reaching a culture that has so many gods as our culture now has, a culture that's no longer familiar with Yahweh God as we are familiar with him. And so we have to begin with the basics, even as Paul did. Interesting how Paul observed that of all the altars, of all the ways that you worship your gods, there's even one, and it's almost a little bit humorous to me, just in case we haven't covered all the bases for all the gods, well, let's make one for an unknown god, in case we left one out. We don't know his name or anything about him, but let's establish one to an unknown god. And what a stroke of brilliance and inspiration that the Apostle Paul says, let me start with your ignorance about the one god, and let me make the unknown God known to you. Task one for each of us in the culture that we live in. I am fascinated by how Paul started. His starting point was to establish the one true God as the creator of everything. It says in verse 24, The God who made the world and all things in it, he is Lord of heaven and earth. In essence, I believe what Paul did was he took the book of Genesis as the starting point. Without apology, he began by saying, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Folks, I think that's where we began in a skeptical culture as well. Evolution has been eroding belief for a long, long time. And, and the book of Genesis has been poo-pooed by scholars and yet I'm finding more and more the book of Genesis is a vitally important book because it explains so many things. It explains much that is commonplace in the world today. Why is there death in the first place? Genesis explains it. Why are all the nations in existence? Genesis explains it. You can go on and on with all the things that are established. Language, all those things established in the book of Genesis, that's where we begin that's where the Apostle Paul began by establishing that there is a God, one true God, Yahweh, who is the creator of everything that exists. He says that one true God is indebted to no man because he's not dependent upon any structure to live in. He is the self-existing one who is far superior to any altar or any other God that you've invented that might exist today. Verse 26, it says that he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth. Again, that's a case out of Genesis. Back to the one man, Adam, God has created all the nations that exist. Look around, you skeptics today. Look around at the nations. Where do they come from? Again, here's the answer in Genesis, which is a case for God as the creator. The final bit of evidence... And there is a, an overwhelming amount of evidence to support it when he says God, in verse 30, has overlooked the times of ignorance, even as he's doing it now. God is declaring, though, to men everywhere, in any age, and certainly in this skeptical age, that you've got to repent because he's fixed a day when he's going to deal with every person. He's fixed a day that he will judge the world in righteousness and he will do it through one man. We understand that man to be our Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the absolute proof. He's furnished proof for 2,000 plus years by raising him from the dead. We understand that. There's more evidence for the resurrection of Christ than many other commonly accepted historical events. And so we have powerful evidence, as Paul had that day on Mars Hill, to say there is a creator God, a true God, and he's going to deal with every one of his creation. Here's the proof what he has done through his son by raising him from the dead. This is the God who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son as we go back to that very, very important verse. Again, in all these things we're sharing, we know that 
It is a daunting task to share the gospel today, as it indeed has been in any age, but especially so today. I look again in Jesus' words in John 3, verses 19 and 20, when he said, This is the judgment. These are the facts. The light has come into the world. Men have loved darkness rather than the light. Their deeds are evil. Everyone who uh, does evil hates the light, does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. There are things going on around in our culture, things of darkness, things that people do not want to have exposed. And so when we bring the light of the gospel, that is a tremendous threat to people, again, in our culture, but people in any age. We know that people don't exactly flock to church to be challenged, to repent, and to believe. We look around and we say there's relatively few of us. People are not beating our doors down to come in and say, i got to repent. My life is messed up and, and i got to come to faith. Well, we'd love to see that happen, but we realize there's a lot of resistance toward that sort of thing happening. And we know when we take the gospel out to others... They're not always eager to have us share the gospel with them. There's a resistance. And so we understand that, but there's a very rich promise in verse 21. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Those that practice the truth are those that are brought to the truth. And maybe the way they're brought to the truth is using a blueprint from Acts 17, Paul's Mars Hill message. Maybe that's the way that we get them to the truth so that as they practice that, they then come to the light of Jesus Christ. But again, we come back to that verse that we dearly love. For God so loved. The God who loved. Yahweh God, the I Am. Not the Muslim God again, not the Buddhist God, not the Hindu God, not any other God being invented in this day and age, the one true God. For God so loved the world. Not just the little nation of Israel, not the United States of America or Canada or Mexico or England or France. The whole world, which is exactly why Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. And whoever believes and has been baptized will be saved, but whoever disbelieved shall be condemned. So God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. By this the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him, 1 John 4, verse 9. And again, Paul's words, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he's fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man, through his only begotten son, whom he's appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. So God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand, he promises in John 10, 27, and 28. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, Romans 6, 23. Again, what a hopeful verse John 3, 16 is. The most hopeful verse I think that we find anywhere in the Bible. But again, in the culture that we live in, a skeptical world needs to be convinced. Again, they need to be convinced, first of all, of who the real true God is who has loved the world. And again, we maintain that he is the creator of Genesis 1-1. We lift it up without apology. That about 6,000 years ago, that God created everything. Not millions and millions of years ago. We need to dispel those, those falsehoods. God created the earth about 6,000 years ago, and he is the one true God who has loved the world. So a skeptical world also needs to be convinced about his only begotten son. You and I know that the history of Christianity has been to distort the truth about his only begotten son. Making the son of God into God the son has added a tremendous amount of unfortunate confusion and skepticism. We lift up the plain truth of who that begotten son really is. And that mention of the word perish 
We know that perish means to cease to exist. People need to know that death is really death. And that's why you want to repent. That's why you want to believe because to perish is a horrible fate. Nothing survives death. Nothing survives judgment. We understand that. So that's exactly what perish means. And so that's something to be very concerned about. But then eternal life, the promise that is made, literally means the life of the age to come. And so we clearly lift up the promises of God, namely endless life in the coming kingdom of God, life that we can scarcely imagine today. So God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life.